and get started here. Um, and uh, it looks like you already have a, a ton of people logged in. I was a little concerned being right after break, but it um, seems like a lot of people probably want to procrastinate to getting yeah. to <laughs> out over break. Um, it's the, uh, yeah, if meetings this morning were already, you know, everybody's still kind of spinning up after Thanksgiving. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the Plant Phenome Journal webinar for today is uh, presented by uh, Tyre Weisner Hanks. He's a formal, former Cornell graduate student, and he's currently a discovery breeder at PepsiCo, which is where he's speaking from right now. Um, he'll be talking on a really cool paper that I was fortunate enough to to uh, help chaperone and edit on uh, autonomous detection of plant disease symptoms uh, directly from aerial imagery. So after uh, Tyre's done talking, we will take questions. And the way we'll do that is either in the group chat, and if you have any problems, feel free to chat in there, or uh, we can uh, unmute your mic and, and go ahead and just ask the question. So without any further ado, uh, Tyre, I look forward to your presentation. Hey, thanks. Um... Yeah, so this is work funded by, um, this is a collaborative effort basically between the Rebecca Nelson lab where I was, Mike Gore's lab at Cornell, and Hod Lipson, who runs a creative machines lab, I think he calls it, uh, down at Columbia. Um, this is funded by National Robotics Initiative, and exactly as the title says, you know, the central goal of this was to get detection of plant disease symptoms, you know, directly from aerial, from UAV imagery. And there we go. So if you are like me, I mean, I'm interested in new technologies and I find you know, new and exciting and fun technologies neat. Um, but I guess I wanted to start with basically what's our motivation? You know, let's, let's be blunt about why would you want to do this? Why would you want to use UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, AKA drones to you know, image and detect plant disease? Um, where does this serve a purpose? You know, our original thinking on this was basically for breeding and genetics. You know, I was interested in this topic basically thinking, um, there was a paper out of our lab a number of years back basically saying, okay, well, if you have three people, let's say three people who are very, you know, experts in identifying a disease, um, evaluate a field trial um, for mapping QTO for disease resistance. And you have some other people, you know, like some are undergrads or whatever, you know, phenotype it, how well of a job do you do at mapping? How good of a job do you do? And, you know, people do okay, but there's a lot of room for precision and increased precision and accuracy. Um, you know, another thing we're thinking of is more traits at once. Essentially, it, if it takes you five hours to walk through your field and score one trait, you can only, you know, basically scales with how many traits you want to do. If you can pull seven traits out of an image versus just pulling six or pulling one, you know, the platform's there and it's already been built and it's been validated. It's not really that much more extra time. You can score multiple things and get that value added. Um, and kind of our, th our third one that we were looking at is, you know, being able to measure early and often. So some things like saying, okay, well, how many days does it take between when you inoculate a disease and when your first symptoms show up? Super valuable trait. Just you know, it's hard to score on a super wide area. It just takes a long time. There's a lot to do during a field season. You know, anybody who's run a field experiment knows there is a ton to do at every given point in the field season. Um, and I think management, I mean, you know, UAVs are becoming more and more of a part of grower operations for more and more growers and in more and more crops. And there's a lot more farmers and growers than there are Breeder, plant breeders in the world. So, you know, management is a logical uh, end use for aerial detection of plant diseases. Um, again, you know, doing more traits at once, people are starting to use UAVs, you know, especially a lot of the cases that seem to be now implemented are, you know, what's my nitrogen management? Am I managing that adequately? You know, making decisions about should I have more or less planting density? Where in my field, you know, needs a special attention? You know, am I irrigating enough? You know, basically, using that to make informed decisions, growers want to be making informed decisions. They only want to spray, you know, management here essentially means spraying fungicides. You only want to spray if it gives you a positive return on investment. You don't want to be doing it otherwise. Um, and there's, you know, variable rate fungicide application is something I've seen some really neat papers on it. Um, it's, there's a Chinese group who was actually talking about spraying right off of drones, which I don't know how 
you know, how concentrated you have to have your active ingredient there. But I think it's a promising thing. I mean, you don't want to spray more than you have to. You don't want to be wasting money on that. And it's not good in terms of resistance management. And, you know, again, being a little critical here, looking at this critically, kind of tamp I was thinking here, okay, I need to tamper my enthusiasm for, I just think drones are super neat. Um, where are they going to be most useful? I think kind of generalizing, let's, you know, there's a few areas where it's like, okay, it's going to be more useful here and it's not really going to be useful in these applications for management. That is deciding when and how much and what you're going to use for fungicides. Um, if you're talking about reactive spraying, you know, saying, okay, well, disease is a little bit worse here or this year, you know, I would decide whether to spray or not. It's obviously going to be more useful. You can use that to make the decision. If you're doing preventative spraying, so, you know, um, late blight in potato, you know, if you see a lesion, your field is toast. You need to be having a preventative spray regimen if you want that field to live. You know, it's going to be less useful there because your decision is basically going to be, okay, well, once the season starts, you know, I'm spraying every week. Or if you're on something like, you know, almonds, I think, or they get, you know, a dozen sprays commonly throughout the growing season. If you have a high value per acre, you know, it's going to end up being more useful because you can say, well, let's really maximize our inputs here. Um, you know, a lot of corn growers, I think in years past, as I've been reading from some of the crop scouting things, you know, people are not spraying because corn prices had fallen in the given year. You know, it's about that return on investment. Where are you going to be making money from a spray? If your disease pressure varies year by year, you know, it's going to be more valuable because you can then make that decision. Whereas if you're in an area, if you're in a river valley and you know, I get gray leaf spot, everyone around me gets it. You know, I'm never going to not spray to control this pathogen. It's going to be less useful. And in terms of specifically, so, you know, when I say imaging here, you know, we're talking about RGB imaging. We're talking about a normal camera. And in that case, you know, visible symptoms are, you're going to be able to make a better informed decision there. Um, there's a lot of really excellent and super interesting work about looking outside the visible spectrum, but then you have to keep in mind a couple of things, you know, one, you're either using a spectrometer, um, you're getting readings that is not images, or two, you're using a more expensive camera, you know, a GoPro costs, what, a few hundred dollars, a good DSLR, or maybe a grand. Um, you know, with lenses and your mounting system, you know, maybe a few grand. You know, if you're talking about a near infrared camera, um, one, you're going to have less resolution for the same price, and two, it's going to be more expensive. If you're talking about a hyperspectral camera, you know, now we're into tens of thousands of dollars versus hundreds. Um, that's not a feasible solution for growers looking to just get some extra information to make a good decision about management. A lot in here, but basically, I think there's been a lot of interest for a long time for a number of years in using machine learning to basically recognize disease symptoms plant disease symptoms from aerial photography for aerial disease phenotyping i mean here's what eight or nine reviews or letters that i've read through that were you know really excited about the technology there's probably at least half a dozen more that mention it um for a long time i think as i was talking with seth kind of right before i talk here I think we're really starting to see, you know, especially kind of this past summer, this past half year, year, we're starting to see a lot more get released. We're essentially seeing the, the delivery of it catch up to the excitement. And I think it's reasonable excitement. You know, I would not call it hype. Hype is kind of a value judgment. When you think excitement's unwarranted, I think the excitement is perfectly warranted. Um, but really we've kind of been talking about a small handful of examples um, of actually looking at the images of a field from the air, something that you'd be taking from an accessible camera that, you know, a grower could afford or that a, you know, a public research program could afford, a regular old RGB camera, and using machine learning to extract out of that, where is the disease here and how severe is it? Um, and that's kind of gone from, you know, early examples we're talking about entire plants. There were some really good examples in. Uh, beets and another cropping system. Um, you know, it's been moving into kind of regions of infection uh, and then, you know, down to individual leaves. So soybean and I think Genshingado was tea plants, I believe. You know, the spatial resolution gets better as our platforms get better. Specifically, let's go into what the disease was that we were working on here. It's northern leaf blight. 
here's the symptoms. As you can guess, it is a foliar disease. It's a leaf disease. Um, it makes these large necrotic lesions. So, you know, they'll start out smallish, but pretty soon they'll be, you know, say one centimeter by five centimeter. Um, and they grow and they coalesce, you know, it all depends on how bad the infection is, the conditions, how susceptible the plants are, et cetera. Um, but, you know, obviously having a bunch of dead tissue on your leaf is not good for your yield. It's not good for your silage quality. Um, and so basically, I mean, the reason we were looking at NLB was we were already studying NLB, but why I think it's a good test case here um, is two things. You know, one, it's tractable because it has these big visible symptoms. If we're talking something like rust, you know, which is an important, super important pathogen for, you know, rust pathogens are common in a lot of different crops. You know, you're trying to identify something from the air. The pustules are a few millimeters wide. You know, there's a lot of important diseases on corn, on field corn, on maize that are, have these small symptoms. Yeah, on like a larger setting, you could be able, you know, you can see, okay, well, this leaf is yellow, but in terms of saying, okay, here's an individual symptom that I can see, that I'm pretty confident I can see from the air, you know, it's tractable when they're larger and they're pretty distinct like this. And the second is, you know, it's economically important. We wanna be working ideally on something where, you know, if we deliver it, we can say, well, this is a concern for growers. And Northern leaf blight is a concern for growers. Um, there was a really interesting kind of amalgamation from a bunch of different people working in, um, uh, in extension and disease management, you know, basically of, okay, well, corn diseases from 2012 to 2015, and what are kind of the estimated losses, yield losses. And NLB was, you know, getting worse over time. 2015, it's about $2 billion in losses. Um, I don't know kind of what it's been across the Midwest, you know, 2017 and beyond, but it's basically one of the top diseases that growers are concerned about across U.S. production areas. Here's, I think for illustration, you know, seeing the photos always does a lot. Here's a particularly bad infection um, on some large corn that was, I mean, this is just down the road. Uh, our lab manager, Judith Colkman, uh, took a photo of this, you know, it can get pretty bad, especially if you have a susceptible variety, which this was. So we have the motivation there. It's a logical disease, and this is a you know an important thing to study. It's it does have a lot of practical applications. Oh, excuse me. So what's the project outline? We have field experiments. You know we're already growing diverse corn lines of various types. You can see hybrids up here that look really nice, and the kind of scraggly inbreds here in the bottom of the picture. But we're growing these field experiments. Let's image them with drones. You go through each of those images, and you have human experts. That is you know, basically me and a postdoc at Mike's lab, um, then postdoc at Mike's lab, going through and annotating, okay, here's the lesion, here's the lesion. You do that thousands and or tens of thousands of times, and you use that as training data for your machine learning model, which is a convolutional neural network. And I'm gonna do my best to do a short two minute explanation of what a CNN, a convolutional neural network is right now. So, it's a class of machine learning model. It's essentially a model where you show it examples and it learns what parameters give you the right answer from input and output based on the examples that you've shown it. And then you test it out on new examples to see how it's performing. It's convolutional because convolution um, is a mathematical function that's kind of at the heart of this. It's a simple function. It's basically like element-wise multiplication and then addition you can do with two matrices. Um, basically, it's just it's a function on two matrices. In this case, there's an input image which can be represented as a matrix. You know, length by width by you know three channels deep, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. Um, and then each of your layers has filters. Those filters are matrices, and you use a mathematical function of convolution to basically, I think of it as. Um, the filters are essentially activated by or respond to certain features in the input image. So on the bottom layer, that's fairly simple features. That could be something like the color red or parallel stripes or um, a bright spot surrounded by dark spots in the regions around it. Um, there's different filters that respond to different things. The pooling layer is basically you downsample it so that it doesn't get the size of the network you know, stays manageable. Then there's another layer and it's called a neural network because of essentially it's was loosely modeled after how neurons work, which is that 
they are connected to neurons that feed in input into them. And then basically by reinforcement, in this case, you know, learning, um, seeing multiple iterations um, of the data, or they're going through multiple iterations, um, those connections are reinforced. Essentially, in this case, the parameters are determined. Um, but the upper layer, you know, processes in an analogous way, combinations of all of the filters in the previous layer and so on. So that basically by the time you get to higher level layers, um, what you have are filters that are responding to or detecting fairly complex combinations of combinations of, you know, simple elements. So when you look at this, um, when you upload a picture, let's say to Facebook and it says, okay, here's a face, here's a face, here's a face. What that is, is a filter in a higher level layer responding to combinations or being activated by combinations of simple features that are characteristic of a face. Um, you have training data at the end, basically, you know, you can train to recognize, say, does this image have a lesion or not? Um, and then through reinforcement, basically go back through the layers and say, okay, well, here's how accurately you gave the answer to this question about is this a lesion or not? Were you accurate? Were you correct? If you adjust the parameters um, and you adjust essentially the weights and how this is structured, um, let's calculate how that would affect the accuracy of your answer, the loss function. I think of that kind of like an error term. It's analogous. And then you say, okay, well, let's adjust the parameters. Let's back propagate it through and get closer to a correct answer. And then let's try it again. So the things to remember here, kind of the two things that are important for how this project was run is that one, you need a massive amount of training data. It's a, you know, you basically get out what you feed into it in a sense, the more training data you have, the better and more robust it's gonna be. And two, it's a black box approach. You know, essentially you're relying on a large amount of training data and designing this with good practices to get out uh, a robust, essentially black box thing that can, that can accurately do what you have asked it to do, what you have trained it to do. So going back to getting the actual images themselves, um, you know, getting from a moving drone in corn plants that are blowing in the wind, getting high resolution images such that you can see something that's a centimeter by five is very difficult. I mean, I'm gonna kind of breeze through the many challenges here. Um, there was a lot of troubleshooting, again, from, you know, in large part from uh, Mike Gore's lab manager, Nick Kazmar, uh, and the postdoc in Mike's lab, Ethan Stewart. Um, it, the drone, you know, stuff can go wrong. The camera cannot work. The drone GPS cannot work. But, you know, specifically, if we're talking about high resolution here, you know, you can fly up a drone and take a picture of some stuff. That's actually relatively, you know, straightforward. If we're talking about, okay, flying this thing, we want high resolution. So that means we probably have to fly at low altitude, you know, also have a high zoom lens on it. If you have low altitude, that means you have low coverage because any one of your images all of a sudden only represents like a meter by two meter spot on the ground, not 50 meters by 100 meters. Uh, if you want to get, you know, less motion blur, that means a slow speed, which means longer flights. You know, the comp essentially getting high resolution just compounds a lot of your problems. Um, and I'll bring this back in later when I kind of wrap up and think about, well, is this useful for beating in genetics yet? You know, the problem that we faced here, we went into this wanting to be able to use this technology and demonstrate its value in a genetic mapping study, you know, in the stuff that was out in the field. We weren't able to do that because essentially, if you take an image, if you want to take an image that's super high resolution, you have to fly very low. And in that case, we can't geo-reference that with high enough precision that is, you know, kind of in the tens of centimeters precision, really confidently to say, okay, this is this plot. This is plot 121, you know, not 122 or 120. So it compounds your problems. Analyzing the images, um, you know, you need experts to identify the symptoms. There's a lot of ways that corn tissue can get damaged. It can be diseases, it can be insect damage, it can just be physical damage, um, it can just be natural senescence, whatever, whatever. You know, you need somebody to confidently say that. You need tens of thousands of examples to do that, which makes this just kind of hard to outsource. Um, and I'll bring this in later, but basically, you know, the method that we ended up going, 
using that works super well was split it up into two tasks, have experts find the symptoms and kind of just say, okay, they're here, they're here. And then have non-experts come in and say, okay, let's draw a line around each of the lesions, do this in much higher fidelity. Um, but, you know, we don't have that to rely on. Again, if you, an example is if you are submitting a web form and you have a CAPTCHA, uh, which, you know, all of us have done now, it says, okay, select everything here that is a street sign. Um, you know, it used to be now select everything that's a cat. So, you know, click on all the pictures of cats. Essentially what you were doing there is providing Google with free training data, outsourced training data to do a very similar task, train a model to recognize objects. You know, they have the advantage of being able to outsource that to millions and millions of online workers, you know, in super high replication. You know, it's harder to do that when you don't have a huge budget. The human annotation, what does that look like? You know, here's an image, it's a nice image. Early in the season, dark green leaves, pretty shady out, very clear lesion distinction. You know, a little bit fuzzy, but generally speaking, you can see the, the symptoms here and they're pretty clear. Okay, you draw a line, you draw another line, and you keep drawing and you draw them on every single lesion there. And so essentially you just hunched over a screen, drawing lines down the axis of this lesion. They're long and skinny, so what we started doing is just saying, okay, let's just mark the major axis of it. You do that 100,000 more times um, until you cannot conceivably stomach looking at any more drone pictures of lesions. Uh, and then we use that as the training data for the neural network. So this is kind of the, the first step, what we would call the expert trained model. Um, and this is again coming out of the, uh, the TPPJ paper here. So I'm going to, because I have a lot to cover, I'm going to gloss over a little bit of the model construction. Um, you know, see the paper if you want to know more about this. But the essential steps in it, first, we're talking about sub-images here because the images themselves have, you know, oftentimes like a dozen or even 50 up to 100 lesions. They're, you know, you can have a lot of lesions even in a small like ground area. So you split them up into sub-images because otherwise if you say, does this image have a lesion? Well, yeah, but that's not super helpful because where is it? How big is it, et cetera. So you talk, we have crops of sub-image crops is what we're talking about when we talk about the training data. Um, there's random modifications, basically scaling, rotating and stuff to make this more robust in the end. And then there's a lot of steps here that are just kind of summarized as train the CNN. But essentially you, choose, you know, you intelligently choose parameters for the CNN, you design it how you think should be good. Um, you then train it to recognize, and what we're training it to do here is say, if you present it with a small portion of an image, say, is there a lesion in this sub-image that you're looking at right now? From that, we can kind of finagle that into, okay, well, where is it in the image? And we can do that by basically saying, here we have a CNN where what it is trained to do is tell you if it's looking at a small square sub image or a small square image, is there a lesion here? Well, we can kind of wrangle that into saying, okay, well, where are the lesions in this image? By taking it, you know, applying it in the top left corner, is there a lesion? No, move over 100 pixels. Is there a lesion? Move over 100 pixels. And basically just do a grid search, a, a sliding, you know, a sliding window approach over a test image. And that gives us out these heat maps. Um, and if you can see here, I hope it's big enough on everybody's screens, but basically, you know, the heat maps will tell you where in this image are the lesions. Um, and it's doing that on basically a, a confidence interval saying, okay, I'm very confident that there's one here. Over here, you know, this kind of looks like a lesion, but it's, you know, I think there's a 0.1% chance, you know, it is a quantitative output. Um, a little bit about the model, uh, model structure and kind of the training, how it worked. We're using a technique called transfer learning. Um, a lot of people have used this when they have like a very specific case and not a whole lot of training data. Um, it's a good way to kind of stretch your training data and use things, not start from basically square one. Um, so we were beginning with a model that was trained on ImageNet. ImageNet is a public database. It's a massive collection of images. I mean, millions of images, thousands of classes. Um, it has multiple different like 
different types and hierarchies of classes. So, you know, sometimes it's like cat or tree or face, things like that. Um, it's a super rich data set. But basically we're using a pre-trained model because we can use that to extract features. This is a model which originally was trained to say, okay, well, recognize all these million different things and distinguish different types of things, recognize patterns in images. It was trained for that purpose. Essentially what you do is you shave off the top layer that says, okay, well now where is a cat? Where is a hand? Where is a face? Where is a car? And then we, you know, subs we basically add on our own, you know, final classification thing. So our final classes, it's not thousands of classes. We basically have lesion or not. Say 100,000 images, here it was, I think only we use like 50,000 actually after filtering and such. Um, but ultimately what you're training it to do then again is say, okay, here's a small square sub image, here's an image crop. Um, is there a lesion here? And the model performance, yeah, it was, it was, I would say quite good. You know, we're getting up to 98% accuracy, 97 and three quarters. Um, our precision and our recall, you know, which are affected by the false positive and false negative rate are comparable, you know, within our percentage point of each other. So we're not really swinging towards, oh, the model is seeing lesions where there aren't any. And we're not really swinging towards, oh, the model is missing all these lesions that truly are there. You know, it's pretty balanced. Um, but again here, what we've got is, you know, not super great spatial resolution. It's still on the order of, okay, well, it can tell you where they are, but, you know, this is not enough to say, okay, here's the lesion and it's yay big and it's yay wide. And again, kind of that's because of what we're putting into it. You know, we're putting in these axes that we had drawn because essentially we looked at, okay, well, what can, there's two of us here and this is a monotonous task that it's hard to keep your concentration up. What can we do? Let's just draw the lines here. Why would we want, what we want are polygon annotations and why do we want this? What's the motivation? Um, I'm gonna look back over towards a paper that was working on surface classifications. So the task here was, okay, is it wood? Is it carpet? Is it fabric, metal, whatever? Um, here's the input image. This is the segmentation. So segmentation being, okay, well, where, you know, every pixel, what is this? Is it carpet? Is it wood, et cetera? And segment that out into these shapes. If you feed it in points, that is say, you know, click 10 points that are wood in this image, click 10 points that are fabric, you get this kind of blobby output because it's, you're not really giving it that much data to learn from. Um, if you instead feed the model uh, polygons and give it, you basically you're feeding it, you know, you're giving it thousands upon thousands of points within this area of the table, let's say, that it can use to learn, oh, okay, that's what wood looks like and the context in which it looks like. Um, you're getting much, much higher spatial resolution in terms of your output, your prediction ultimately. So we face this and basically we just said, you know, it takes forever to draw polygons around this. We cannot feasibly do this. We have stuff to do. We can't sit over a screen and just do this basically nonstop for a couple months. Um, so what we did is we split it up. Well, we already had this thing of the experts found the lesion and said, okay, here's where I think the lesions are. There's a lot of value, you know, or judgment calls there. Too blurry here. I don't think that's Northern Leaf Blight. I'm pretty confident this is Northern Leaf Blight, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we shopped out is the actual drawing of the lesion boundaries and to non-experts. Um, we were using the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. If you're not familiar, it's a really commonly used platform for crowdsourcing things. You pay people a small amount per task. And there's lots of tools for basically validating and approving people. Um, so people use this for a generating large data sets that kind of need a human to look. Um, and so what they saw was basically this on the left. It was a sub-image crop that had been pulled out from a larger image. Um, it had a line down the center of the lesion. So they knew basically, what do you draw boundaries around? And this one, I mean, is honestly pretty blurry here, what they were shown. But you can see on the right, that kind of bright green line is the agreement between all three, um, the area that's shared between all three of them. They honestly do a pretty good job a lot of the time. We spent a lot of time kind of trying to figure out the best way to get good training data out of mechanical torque workers. Um, but most of the time, honestly, if it's a clear picture, they did a pretty good job. Sometimes, like in this case, you know, somebody drew random, just random junk. Maybe they were just testing it out or they wanted to see what this task was like, whatever, you know, they're just curious. 
Um, so, you know, there's filtering that goes into this when you have these anonymous online workers. Um, but I don't know, I mean, so I'm thinking back to this uh, quote, I think Jesse Poland said in a talk like years ago, fast, cheap, good, pick two. We actually, you know, we basically got a nice balance of all three. It was pretty affordable. So we were paying four cents per lesion. Every task was just drawing one lesion. You can structure it differently, however you want. But so we were paying when we had three workers do it and there's one cent to Amazon for every task. So it's 15 cents a lesion. Um, we were getting those again in triplicate. We were usually getting over 3000 tasks done per hour. I mean, so basically as much as you can conceivably want and pay for and process, you can upload it and it'll be done you know, within days, not weeks. And it's decently high quality. So here's a histogram of the overlap, um, percentage overlap between pairs of polygons drawn by Mechanical Turk workers. Or again, there's three of them per image or per lesion. You know, Overlap of one is they're exactly identical, completely identical. Overlap of zero is they don't overlap at all. There's an overlap of 0.7 and looking at these, it's honestly pretty good. Um, a lot of qualitatively speaking, when I went back and looked at, you know, a few dozen, a few hundred of the images where they had low overlap, a lot of them are kind of blurry, just ambiguous. Something's occluded. It's a little bit hard to see. It's dark out. It's really sunny that day. So it gets kind of sunned out. Um, you know, honestly, what we found is that most of the uh, most of the input could be used to say, okay, well, they're doing a pretty good job. They tend to do a pretty good job. And if three people do it, especially who normally do a good job, draw three polygons that don't agree with each other, that one should be flagged and or just thrown out. So you get kind of an automatic internal check when people do multiple images, because you can see, does this person tend to do a good job in terms of their agreement with other workers? So what, how do we use this overall in the end? Well, it's a pretty similar setup, basically steps one and two. You have, you train a classification model. In this case, we're not training it to say, here's a square image, does this contain lesion? What we're training it to say is, here's a square image, is it exactly centered in a lesion? So if it contains a lesion, but it's not centered in it, then it says, you know, that's part of the no lesion training data, which gives you a lot higher spatial precision. Again, we're sliding this model across the images in a sliding window, and that gives you a probability map out. You say, okay, every 100 pixels tell me, is this centered on a lesion? Um, and you can you know, do more or less fine scale. We use multiple spatial scales. The step three, which is new, is using a conditional random field, which is basically a model which combines the heat map, the probability map, and the input image to segment the image into the two classes. So it's saying, okay, well, this was predicted to be high confident, um, high confidently uh, as a lesion, but we know there's some wiggle room, and it's right, but it's right next to a bunch of pixels that look a lot like it. Okay, well this is going to be a lesion, um, and essentially that gives you the kind of fine scale segmentation, pixel by pixel, that you were really interested in at the end. This I'll give a caveat. This is kind of an politely speaking, it's an old school way to do it, but this is a little bit of an outdated method that I picked. Um, you know, modern methods would basically, rather than saying, well, let's train a model to classify things based on square images and then kind of force it to give us what we want, which is segmentation in the end, modern models will basically say, let's go straight to the segmentation. Give me a model which is done based on segmentation. The advantage here to using this kind of heat map, you know, classification, heat map, conditional random field to segment is that we can make, because we are already generating heat maps from the, uh, you know, the expert trained model, we can make easier comparisons. We can isolate the effects of crowdsourcing and say, okay, well, here's this extra step. You know, if somebody's interested in doing this on a different disease, is it worth their trouble to set up a crowdsourcing platform? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. And we'll, we'll you know, cover that in the next few slides. Um, but it allowed us to basically isolate that out. Newer models. Um, so if you check out uh, Ethan Stewart, and Mike Gore's former postdoc, He's got a paper, I think, forthcoming or preprint over in remote sensing. We're using a different model called Mask RCNN, um, just based on the lines. It solves some pretty awesome results there. You know, newer models can do a better job faster. But I mean, that's the kind of advantage of let's treat high throughput phenotyping, let's treat phenomic data like genotypic data, let's treat it like other machine learning tests. You know, it's a resource to be shared. 
I think we can see if anybody's familiar with the plant village data set, which is a well curated, super large data set of plant disease images. I mean, we're up to dozens of papers, I think now, that are basically trying out different methods, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, looking at specific cases. You know, that's the point and the beautiful thing about like sharing and publicizing your raw data. So what does these richer annotations get us? You know, I might say this is the impact of crowdsourcing, but really what crowdsourcing gets us to is it's feasible to get these polygons, these richer annotations without just absolutely draining your time and energy. Um, you know, it basically becomes feasible to get that. So here on the top row, we can see, you know, based on the expert trained model and the crowdsourced model, you know, we've got an annotation here. It's just a line down the middle. Our heat map is accordingly, you know, because you can only do so much when you basically just have like a rough outline of, okay, here's where the lesion is, it's in this area. Your heat map is accordingly, you know, a coarser spatial scale than when we're on the crowdsourced image. Um, you know, when, we're, when you feed into, okay, well, here's exactly where is the lesion, inside the lesion and not, you get accordingly a more fine spatial scale of prediction out. So this heat map, again, is a quantitative prediction of how confident are you that there's a lesion right here. Um, and the CRF, the segmentation, I'll talk the numbers about this in just a second, but basically you can kind of do it, you can kind of get it with a heat map, but the problem is that it's just not a fine enough spatial scale to really narrow down and say, okay, here's the lesion. Whereas when you start out with a more fine spatial scale, you can segment pretty accurately. So the crowdsource model performs pretty well in terms of classification, that is that kind of initial thing that we uh, that kind of initial thing that we gave it, which is, okay, is it this centered on lesion or not? We're seeing accuracies of 0.97 um, at or comparable to or a little below what the expert trained model was, the one from TPPJ. So a little bit lower accuracy, but a harder task kind of. Um, relatively comparable precision recall and an acceptable F1. In terms of segmentation, that is, okay, pixel by pixel, did you get every pixel right relative to the crowdsourced, you know, this polygon, which is our ground truth. Super high accuracy, um, that's because most of the image is a true negative. That is, you know, 95% of the image, 99% of the image isn't a lesion. So you're, you know, and the, and the model recognizes that, so it gets a ton of things right because it says, well, there's no lesion here. The F1 is a lot lower, it's at 0.71. Um, that's still acceptable, it's not great, um, but as we'll see in a couple slides, basically the overall area when you look at it is pretty darn good comparing this segmentation to the crowdsourced ground truth. And then what do we get in terms of effects? Well, you know, you get increased spatial, spatial resolution. Um, segmentation is now possible, so in terms of segmentation F1, 0.76 is actually after we drop a few examples where humans had missed things. But with polygons, is that 0.76? It's 0.21 if you're starting with lines. And basically you can do more with less. So the expert trained model used originally 25,000 of those expert annotations um, to train it up. The crowdsource model used around 5,000. So you can spend less time on that, you know, again, if you are a scientist, a pathologist, a geneticist, you have a lot to do. You know, you can do more with less by saying do a fifth as many and then put them on your crowdsourcing platform. Um, the, when you look at the actual area, percentage proportion rather of an image that is classified as lesion versus non-lesion, what you can see here are the CRF, this is a, a like final segmentation and the ground truth. Pretty high agreement, um, you know, are almost at 0.9, um, a one-to-one -one relationship. So between the segmentation here and the ground truth, it's not like it's overestimating. But then you see this funny set of points right here, basically it's seven images, seven parent images that have multiple lesions in each image. So you're talking a few to maybe even like 50 lesions per image. You have seven cases where humans and the model output disagree a lot. That is, the model is seeing lesions where humans saw none. And we went back and looked at those, looked at each of those seven. Five of them, humans had missed things. So either the expert, that is me or Ethan, had missed something, you know, just you drew a lot of lines but didn't catch a few of them, maybe just skipped the image too quickly, um, accidentally, you know, missed a keystroke, or the uh, people who were 
the MTurk workers happen to say, okay, well, I see this, but they didn't get the entirety of the lesion captured here. Um, two of them were false positives. So these are basically senescent leaves where the model output said, oh, there's, there's northern leaf blight, but it's just a senescent leaf. But basically there's seven instances where they disagree and then five of them, you know, our weak human brains had just missed something. You know, humans make errors. Um, and those were essentially caught and the model outperformed humans. When you drop those five errors, the, you know, the R, the correlation between the proportion of the image that is being classified as lesion or not, including those two where the model was wrong, you know, it raises from 0 0.89 to 0 0.94. Um, this third one that you're seeing, the heat map is basically, okay, well, what if we skip this kind of complicated to optimize CRF step and just took the heat map and basically segmented it out. And it performs actually, you know, moderately well, um, except it tends to overestimate things because it's a little blurry. So here's some, everyone likes seeing just some nice examples. These are cherry picked. I picked them because they were good, clean input images. But, you know, if you can see them closely on your screen, you know, basically we're, we're really, down to the millimeter here. I mean, we're getting these things very, very finely, tightly defined. Um, these are raw uncropped images coming straight off a drone. We can now do, you know, basically the core of what we set out to do, the very first step of what we set out to do, which is, can you fly a drone, image plants, and get an output where it says, here are your lesions, here are how big they are, and exactly where their boundaries are. And it's not being caught up by, I mean, if you're looking through here, there's senescent leaves, there's flea beetle damage, there's just physical scarring, there's tassels, which took a long time to, you know, when you're first starting out, we said, okay, well, this is kind of, because tassels can kind of look like a lesion. There's lots of things that for cruder methods, would it would get caught up, but here it's performing super well. Zooming in on some non-biased examples, so these are 12 that I randomly selected from our test set of images. Again, you see, you know, Mostly speaking, it's pretty precise down to the millimeter. There's always going to be some ambiguity. These are images can be blurry. They can be a little bit shaded out or too sunny. Sometimes you get really poor performance here. Like this is probably, I don't know the, remember the context, but I think this one was a senescent leaf that also had some pretty clear NLB things. But broadly speaking, we're getting very, very nice fine segmentation. And again, this is agreeing very well with what the ground truths do, and it's getting a lot of things that humans miss. So wrapping up here, future perspectives, what have we achieved you know, in this project? We had a lot of goals that I think, you know, we had goals that we did not meet, but our core goals were, you know, that we succeeded at were we can detect lesions of this disease from UAV images. You know, we can do that with fairly high success rate. We can segment the image into now lesion and non-lesion at a spatial scale. So you can now go in and say, okay, well, what percentage of this image is covered in lesions? Um, and basically, you know, it is not fun to draw. I drew 85,000 lines on, I don't know, 15,000 corn images. That is not fun. It is mind numbing you know, we have now demonstrated that you can do a lot less work and crowdsource the rest and get higher resolution annotations. And that actually works way better. Um, you know, if somebody wants to implement this in their own path system, they don't want to be doing that, just drawing lines for a month or two. You know, we all have other things to do. So, you know, crowdsourcing ended up being super useful. Where to go next? I mean, I think specifically for, let's say, corn, you know, distinguishing between multiple diseases. This is entirely about northern leaf blight. There are a lot of other target diseases. A lot of them, you know, if they have smaller symptoms like gray leaf spot or any of the rust diseases, um, you know, eye spot, those are going to be a lot harder to get from drones. I think we'll have to, you know, and there's not a clear, often not a super clear delineation for some of these between what's a diseased area and what's not. You know, it's not a super clear boundary. I think that's going to be an interesting frontier. Um, the advantage is that you can recycle, you know, annotations and combine things from different people. Um, second, we were really interested in testing heritability. I mean, for breeding and genetics, if we're talking about improving over what humans do walking through a field, you know, there's no substitute for walking your field trials and keeping an eye and being there in person. But is this going to be better than gauging things by eye saying, okay, that's a one, that's a seven, that's a nine, you know, is, is used in lots of diseases. We use percentages, but, you know, is it heritable? Do I map things better? Is this a trait that's more heritable or more replicable? Is this more 
you know, is there less noise here? Um, we weren't able to test that, but I think that's a, you know, kind of the major question for it in terms of this thing's adoption into breeding genetics. And then third, I mean, improve models and practices. You know, people I'm sure are going to take this exact same data and within two years, you know, a computer science master's student will say, okay, well, I did this way better method. And that's ideal. That's, I think we see, we've now seen with, um, with Plant Village, just how powerful that can be. You know, there's a ton of new and fascinating things going on. You know, that's how the computer science field works. There are reference data sets um, that everybody's using to benchmark their performance. Um, we saw, you know, Ethan succeeding and getting some really awesome results with mask RCNN. You know, there are new models that are published out that are kind of setting the benchmark for similar tasks, identification and segmentation all in one. Um, but, you know, that's the reason why now we need to have phenomic data uploaded and available like genomic data always has been. Um, and is this useful? I mean, this is somewhat of a critical downer note, but I think, you know, breeding and genetics, let's be realistic. This platform that I have just described coming out of this grant, it's not useful as is for breeding and genetics because we were not able to get, you know, physically tying an image to a plot in the field saying, did this come from plot 178 or 179? You know, that will be a more complex task that just, I think one of the big takeaways from this is that setting up these platforms is a huge investment and getting them exactly how you want and making sure it's right is a huge time investment. You know, I think it's worth it, but everyone needs to be realistic when they're approaching this task. I think management, I mean, for corn disease management, you know, the value added comes in telling growers the information that they need to use, that they need to make a proper decision, to make an informed decision. A picture of the field does not really get anyone anywhere. What matters is, you know, being able to extrapolate out from here, okay, yeah, this is, you've got more disease here, you've got less disease there. And I think this is pretty close to you know, useful in the field in terms of corn production. Um, I think it would probably have a lot more value in something, you know, like a super high value uh, spray intensive crop, like a lot of fruits or vegetable crops. Um, grapes comes up a lot in terms of people's excitement about this because um, spray regimens can be very intense and there's a lot of diseases to manage. Um, but in this thing, I mean, I see this as pretty close to being able to be implemented in terms of management. Um, you also have the advantage there. You don't need to get every single square foot of your field. Get it every 10 meters on a grid. Get it every 20 meters on a grid. You know, go through and sample it intensively. That's way, way more intensive sampling than you would be having from just scouting your field, you know, walking a zigzag pattern on it. You're getting a vast amount of information compared to that. But I think, you know, again, that's a little bit critical, but I think we owe it to you know, this was publicly funded work. We owe it to the funding source, to the US public to be critical about this. But I do think for management, you know, it's it's close to being able to be implemented. So with that, I'll move over to thanks and questions. So thanks from the Gore Lab, you know, there was a massive amount of work just getting these images. That was, you know, two summers of the grant was getting sufficient images. Uh, Nick and Ethan from Mike Gore's lab really worked super hard to get these drones up and running. You know, when things broke, when cameras did not work, they uh, sorted all that out. From the Lipson lab, um, Chad DeChant was the main grad student there. Harvey Wu was a talented undergrad who worked with super closely. He's the other co-first author on the Plant Phenome Journal paper. Um, and from Rebecca Nelson's lab, you know, Judy Kolkman, invaluable in getting all these field things up and running every year. Uh, and funding for this all came from the NSF National Robotics Initiative. And with that, I will move over to questions. All right. Well, thank you, Tyra. Very innovative, uh, very innovative work and uh, great seminar. Um, what we're going to do now is open it up for questions for the next um, oh, 10 minutes or so. And so you can either write those questions in the group chat um, or you can unmute. I'll give you an opportunity to do so in a little bit. Uh, turn down your volume and go ahead and ask questions after you introduce yourself. So while we're waiting for you to think about questions here, I'm going to make a brief plug for the Plant Phenome Journal, which is where this work's published. Uh, open access society journal that's really dedicated to advancing issues. And I think this was uh, a phenomenal 
um, example of the type of work we really are looking forward uh, to pushing the frontiers of plant science. So I'm going to take uh, my host advantage and, and ask the first question. Um, so one of the steps you uh, kind of alluded to, but didn't really specifically mention here, Tara, was um, turning this into quantitative information. So you mentioned the problem with stitching and not identifying a plot, but um, was there actually a way that you've gotten quantitative information within an image for you know, how big the lesions are or anything like that, or is that really next steps? Yeah, so quantitative, I mean, what we've got is relative to the ground truth in one image. So you can say, okay, well, here's, okay, the percentage of this image that I'm looking at that is covered by lesions. And then, yeah, um, I don't think it was in any of the stuff we submitted, but, you know, you can do major or minor access, run, P, you know, identify connected components and then run PCA to find, okay, how long are they? How wide are they? How many are they? What's the distribution of things? Um, but yeah, in terms of tying it to a plant one, yeah, we definitely did not get that. And then, you know, stitching is the obvious way to go about it because then you can say, okay, I'm looking at everything all at once. The problem we faced here was if you fly high enough that you can stitch the images, it's not resolution to get the uh, lesion size. Um, if you fly low enough to, to uh, see the lesions and get them super high resolution, then yeah, you can't stitch. But yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, that's why I think it's not quite relevant yet for, um, not quite relevant yet for breeding or not able to go into breeding quite yet is, yeah, just can't tie it back to there and get quantitative. Okay. Uh, I see some on the chat. Should I just go through those in the? Yeah, I mean, I can read them out or if you want to read them out, go ahead and just start from top to bottom. I see three right now. Yeah, I see three. Yeah, I will start. I'll read them out here. Um, so Scott Wilde had asked, what height level did we fly the drone to get images? And if we could redo it with a better resolution, how much of a difference would you expect? Better resolution camera. Um, altitude, the altitude control on the drones was, could be kind of finicky, but it was about five meters. Um, so, you know, you don't want to get too low because otherwise then you get, uh, you know, basically the, the, the actual propellers and the downdraft from the drone will start to move everything around and then you get motion blur um, and that's annoying. Resolution camera actually was not the main determinant. The main problem was motion blur. Um, so we had a pretty beefy lens on this. Um, it was a DSLR, like most all these images are taken with a DSLR with a pretty big zoom lens. Um, the zoom lens to get it so that you could fly higher but still get good resolution. The main problem was, you know, you'll get motion blur trying to get those images, things, you know, if there's just a breeze out in the field, that was probably the, the biggest one. Um, and then of course, to solve motion blur, you have to fly slowly, which means that you can cover only a small area. Um, the next one from your name uh, says, what platform working with these images? Yeah, um, so for some of the basic, yeah, it was all in Python um, for, uh, some of the basic processing things, yeah, I was working with OpenCV, uh, and then I used PyTorch, and Harvey used PyTorch as well for basically those things. I don't remember what platform Ethan was using, but I used PyTorch because I'm familiar with Python, and it was a nice usable library, uh, and Torch Vision. Um, and XS was wondering, how does flowering affect the result? So it definitely does. Um, we, again, because we were not able to tie things back to individual plots, I can't tell you, okay, well, if you are, because our, we have diverse lines, some of the plots flower earlier, some of them flower later. Um, because of that, I can't tell you, okay, well, a, a weakened flowering difference will impact you here, here. But what I can definitely tell you is maturity in general, well, one, the actual flowers themselves are dark, you know, they die before the leaves do, and they're dark brown skinny things that overlay your leaves. So um, kind of our first steps into this, which we published in Phytopathology based on handheld images, a lot of, you know, dead tassels essentially were a common thing that were mistaken for lesions. Um, here that wasn't really an issue because we had enough data essentially. Um, maturity definitely does because it's way, and this is true for humans too, it's way easier to distinguish between NLB lesions and just regular leaf senescence when it's early in the season and there is no leaf senescence. So right here, you know, these are pretty dark green leaves. It's a lot easier to see. There's no senescence to get confused with. There's not those senescent leaves on the bottom. Um, yeah, you know, flying in July 
or early August, way, way easier to see these lesions and it's much, much clearer. Later August, when things are starting to senesce and mature and dry down, a lot harder. But then again, that's, we find that when humans are out walking too, you're like, is this a, you know, here's a lesion, but also the leaf right beneath it is starting to senesce and die just naturally. Um, Bishwa Sapkota asks, if the overall goal was to develop the heat maps, do you see a value in testing some traditional but simple image analysis approaches, such as thresholding, random forest, support vector machines to calculate the pixel coverage, and then convert to heat maps? Looks like green pixels versus brown white pixels. Yes. So that was the first thing we tried. Um, we tried that using RGB images, and we tried that using um, not a near infrared camera, but uh, just a commercial handheld camera that was modified basically to the near infrared filter was taken out so you could kind of use it to get a pseudo NDVI, I guess we would call it. Um, yeah, the main problem with there is that there's a lot of dead brown tissue. Um, so we didn't, I, we did not try any sort of other like random forces support vector, any non neural network, non CNN machine learning approaches. Um, but yeah, we did try thresholding. We tried some kind of more complex assemblages of standard image processing techniques. Um, so thresholding, uh, candy edge detection, using like candy edge detection and then kind of building rules about this. Um, uh, so we tried, all, we tried a few of those kind of merged together. The problem was that, yeah, there's lots of sources of dead tissue. It could be physical damage. It could just be dead leaves. It could be the tassels. It could be, you know, any, any number of different things. And so it would just start to catch all those, even when you can say, okay, I have an NDVI camera or a camera that can detect an IR. That will tell me the difference between dirt and plants. You know, you at least get to dead plant tissue and dirt can be distinguished pretty well. But even then, you know, what we would just see is it was impossible to build all of these complex rules about, okay, well, today it's more bright, it's less bright, it's more sunny, here are things kind of shaded out, it's later in the season, et cetera. Um, it just never worked out super well. So neural networks ended up being the most robust thing by far. Cool. Um, and I think that's it in the chat. Did anyone have any questions kind of in person? Yeah, go ahead and unmute your microphone if you have a question you'd like to ask. And Hearing none and seeing that it's almost uh, noon here in Central Time. Um, well, let's thank Tyra for a great talk. And um, I will try and get this up uh, as soon as I can. And we look forward to future work coming out of uh, your PhD, Tyra. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. And again, please check out the TPPJ article if you have questions about, you know, how the model was made. There's more in there. And yeah, looking forward to seeing all the other neat stuff that's coming out in the drone field. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Ed.